Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 9th Public Petitions Committee meeting of 2015. Uh, I would remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones and electronic devices, as this may interfere with uh, the sound system. Uh, we have one apology today, is David Torrance. Is there any further apologies? Uh, today's business is uh, agenda item number one is consideration of new petitions and the first item of business is consideration of three new petitions and the committee will hear from the petitioner of each. Unfortunately, the first petitioner has been uh, delayed and so we'll now move on to the, the second petition and the uh, petition is PE1556 by John Mayhew on behalf of the Scottish Campaign for National Parks and the Association for the Protection of Rural Scotland on National Park Strategy for Scotland. Members have a note by the clerk and a spice briefing. And may I welcome the petitioner, John Mayhew, to the meeting. He is accompanied today by John Thompson from the Scottish Campaign of National Parks and Charles Miller from the Association of Protection of Rural Scotland. I now invite Mr Mayhew to speak to his petition for up to five minutes. And Therefore, we will then move on to uh, questions. So, Mr. Major. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting us to give evidence today. As you say, I'm uh, joined by uh, Charles, who's the chairman of APRS, and John, who's the honorary secretary of SCNP. So, there's representatives from both of the organisations that form the partnership that's putting forward this petition. Um, I'd like to give you a quick recap of the historical background as to how we arrived where we are today. Um, our two organisations campaigned for many decades to have national parks in Scotland, um, and we were successful with the, the Act in 2000 and the first two national parks in 2002 and 2003. And since then, we've been continuing to argue for more. Uh, we ran a, a more formal joint project starting in 2010, and that uh, culminated in our unfinished business report, which I think you've all just been handed a copy of. I've certainly given copies to the clerk for you. And that sets out our case in full. If I were to summarise our case, I would say that it really comes back to Scotland's landscapes, which are amongst the best in the world, and yet we only have two national parks, which is recognised across the world as the best way of protecting and, and designating our best landscapes. Those first two national parks have achieved a great deal in their first decade, and we feel that they really inspire pride and passion amongst local people and amongst visitors. But there are other outstanding landscapes in Scotland which are also worthy of national park designation and there is local support for this and national public support for this. We feel that more national parks would bring additional resources to those areas, would strengthen Scotland's international standing for environmental protection and it would support our crucial tourism industry. We've had some good progress but we do feel Scotland's now lagging behind other parts of the UK in national park designation. So for example, 7% of Scotland is covered by national parks compared to 20% of Wales. And we therefore feel that we're missing out on those benefits and opportunities that more national parks could bring. And that's why we feel that the Scottish Government should prepare a strategy to designate more national parks. As the note which you were given observes, there were debates held in Parliament in 2008, 2009, 2013, and many of your colleagues, many MSPs, praised the work of the two existing national parks, and some MSPs called for more to be designated. There's also local support. We're pleased to note that many of the thousand or so people who signed our petition were from residents of the areas that we've identified as suitable for more national parks, and many of those made supportive comments. In 2008, a clear majority of the residents of the Isle of Harris voted for national park status in a referendum held in 2008, but that hasn't come to pass. We're in touch with local supporters in several of the areas who are keen to work with us. And we also feel that consideration of more national parks could support current efforts by Parliament and Government to promote community empowerment. We feel national parks bring real benefits to Scotland, obviously environmental benefits in terms of protecting our landscapes and protecting our habitats, but also socio-economic benefits in terms of job creation and the tourism industry. And we've been working a bit more on this in particular, the socio-economic benefits, and we've, we've recently published a report, which I can leave with you, um, called the Socio-Economic Benefits of New National Park Designations in Scotland, and that sets out what we think these benefits are in rather more detail. 
Our proposals are widely supported by other organisations, including, for example, the National Trust for Scotland or the Scottish Wildlife Trust. So although we are leading the campaign, there are plenty of others that agree with us. Um, and finally, turning to possible action, I, I note your clerk's suggestion that you might consider writing to the Scottish Government and to Scottish Natural Heritage about this, and if you felt that was appropriate, we'd certainly support that, as that would help to generate the sort of debate that we're seeking on this issue. Thank you. That's all I have to say for now, and I'm, we're all very happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr Mayhew. And uh, perhaps I could start the question by asking, what areas would you highlight as candidates for national parks, and what argument would there be in favour uh, of these areas? If you've, if you've got the report in front of you, I wondered if you could turn to page 28, where there's a map which summarises it most clearly. When we wrote the report, we were really setting out the principal argument that there should be national parks and that it was the, the government's place to carry out the assessment and to prepare the strategy as to where those places might be and what order they should be designated in. But we also felt that we needed to put our cards on the table, as it were, and to say where we thought the, the National Park should be. So after long discussions within our organisations, we highlighted a possible seven areas, and we feel that all of these seven areas have superb landscapes, have fantastic habitats and wildlife, and would merit from the sort of additional input and integrated management which National Parks can bring. So those are our seven proposed areas and we would be delighted if any of those were designated as a national park um, but we are not government organizations we are non-government organizations therefore that is merely our proposal and that map has no official status at all it's simply born out of long experience and, and knowledge of the areas concerned questions um, three questions here. small ones okay one is uh, Who's actually funded this publication? I think the funders are listed on the inside front cover. So it was a range of different charitable trusts. We carried out some fundraising beforehand, and that was where it came from. But that, that didn't just fund the report. It, it funded the project which led up to it, the research and the consultancy work which, which led up to it. Thank you. Um, the second question I wanted to ask was in terms of Isle of Harris report and you said that you've not been able to convince the Scottish government. What is the Scottish government's reaction? What was the Scottish government's reaction to this particular <coughs> uh, My memory of what happened at the time was that the, um, the local people of Harris, there, there was a, a local study group called the Isle of Harris National Park Study Group and they commissioned research and they carried out a feasibility study and they organised the, the referendum which as I say ended up in, in a clear majority of, of people voting and also a clear majority in favour. They then support, they then sought support of their local authority, Western Isles Council, because obviously that would help their case as well. Western Isles Council then carried out uh, quite a bit of research, including seeking evidence and carrying out site visits. Um, and Ultimately, the, the, the debate which took place in the full council was inconclusive, so they agreed neither to support it nor to oppose it, but they agreed to pass the decision to the Scottish Government. And the Scottish Government at the time uh, felt that they weren't willing to proceed without local authority support, although looking at the Act, the National Park Act, does not say that it has to have local authority support. Um, obviously, it's preferable if it does, but there's no legal requirement for that to take place. Uh, I'm going to ask John if, he rem if I remember that correctly. Yes, that's certainly my recollection of it. Um, and perhaps one further comment in relation to local authorities. I think there is only one case in the UK where the creation of a national park has been favoured by the local authority, um, and that was actually Loch Lomond and the Trossachs, interestingly enough, partly obviously because of its history as a regional park which had been set up by local authorities in the, f in the first place. Um, but certainly the opposition of local authorities to the establishment of national parks is um, a very well-established tradition. I think the, if I remember the debate on the Western Isles, some of the councillors uh, on Western Isles Council 
were not in favour of the designation because they felt it would prevent development, wrongly in our view, because we feel national parks support sustainable, appropriate development. They do not stop development. But that, that was their perception. And others queried why we were limiting it just to Harris and should not Lewis be included or the whole of the Western Isles be included. So there were boundary issues as well as issues of principle. And I think that uh, that's a very brief summary of, of my memory of that debate. Yeah, there's also a comment on, uh, this is my third question, uh, Chair, uh, about um, the SNP's manifesto and their commitment in their manifesto. Um, and you've, you've gone as far as 2013, now we are in 2015. <coughs> Is there any progress, or do you feel the government is just sitting on its hands on this issue? As far as I'm aware, there hasn't been any progress in implementing that manifesto commitment, which is quoted in here, and, and it says we will work with communities towards the creation of more national parks, which was a commitment we really welcomed. We thought that rather than saying we will designate more national parks, we thought it was entirely appropriate to, uh, to work with communities. But uh, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been any progress on that, which obviously disappoints us and we'll be seeking to ask all the political parties to put a commitment to more national parks in their manifestos for a year's for the elections a year's time Thank you very much. Just, just, just bring in the uh, why do you think local authorities are perhaps saying opposed to national parks is it because it may uh, <coughs> like stop any future development in the areas I I'll answer first and then ask my colleagues if they've got anything to add. I, I think it's, it's not so much that. I think they, um, they sometimes fear um, loss of power, loss of control, loss of influence, particularly in planning. And although national parks are not just about planning, um, a lot of the controversial debates which take place in national parks, as in other parts of Scotland, are to do with planning applications and proposed developments. And local authorities... Uh, are used to being the planning authority for their area and when a national park is set up um, those planning powers can be transferred to the national park authority or they can stay with the local authority the uh, the act the 2000 act which this parliament passed is uh, very um, commendable in that it's very flexible and provides different governance models so in Loch Lomond and the Trossachs we have the full planning authority which makes the forward plans and also determines the planning applications. The situation is different in the Cairngorms where the local authorities have retained planning powers and that was negotiations which was done at the time that the local authorities were unwilling to, as they saw it, give up those planning powers. But the National Park Authority has a right to call in for its own determination any applications which it feel influence the uh, are concerned with the special qualities of the national park itself. So, for example, small householder extensions to individual dwellings would clearly be the province of the local authorities, but a major housing development or a major hotel or a major recreational development would clearly be relevant to the national park authority, so they would call that, call that in. So I, th I think the, the concerns revolve around plannings, but there are ways in which local authorities can still be involved in the, the planning of national parks and indeed the way the legislation works the majority of the board members are either representatives of the local authorities or they're directly elected local people um, as I think is right and so even if planning powers are transferred the people who are taking those powers are predominantly local residents could I just check if I've missed anything from either of my colleagues oh, you've captured that yep. uh, I just add that I think there is perhaps a distinction to be drawn, and we do mention this in the report, between parks that lie wholly within the territory of a single local authority, which was obviously the case with the proposed Harris one, um, and those which straddle the boundaries, as do the existing two national, national parks. And although straddling boundaries can itself give rise to some problems, um, w one can more readily see... The, the, the justification for a separate authority where that applies rather than where it lies all within the territory of a, a single authority. Um, but we do address that in the report and, and we make the point, which I think is very important in a Scottish context, that there is flexibility in the legislation and it does enable you to tailor the precise governance arrangements to the circumstances of a particular area. Uh, and we would certainly see rather different arrangements applying somewhere like Harris from those that currently apply, say, in Loch Lomond and the Trossachs. Jackson? Uh, thank you. Oh, sorry, two Themes I'd like to explore. One just touches a little bit where you 
been answering just now and possibly, in fact, has covered it. But um, the term national parks itself, uh, as you say, we were slower in Scotland to evolve these. They've evolved elsewhere internationally. And probably in the public mind, then, there is an expectation of what they think a national park is. Is this wholly variable and flexible arrangement that you talk about in some ways an obstacle in the sense that it creates complications, variations, and perhaps raises expectations in people's mind as to what it is that a park would be, uh, only then to find it ends up being a very kind of complicated arrangement which kind of loses the support and will of people along the way to its implementation? The term means different things to different people across the world, but the, the crucial advantage of it, as I suppose you would call it a brand, is that it's a term which is recognised worldwide. It's the only designation which everybody from across the world has heard of. So if I go on holiday to Italy, for example, I would seek out the national parks right. to go and visit because they are likely, in my experience, um, to be spectacular places with wonderful wildlife and, crucially, a warm welcome, a, a system for welcoming people welcoming visitors and helping them to get the most out of their visit. Same applies when people come to Scotland. People come to Scotland, they say, where are the national parks? And they head for the Cairngorms and they head for Loch Lomond and the Trossachs, which is wonderful, but we would like to see those benefits spread to other places which, which merit them. The, I think what, what we have to remember is that uh, is the, the basic concept of a national park, which is it's a special area and it should be managed in a special way. It's worthy of extra re national resources going into it and all the complexities of actually managing it are subsidiary to that basic idea that this is a place which Scotland can be proud of and it's somewhere which is internationally famous and it's somewhere that we're really trying to do our best to look after the place, look after the people that live there and welcome visitors as well. So it, people do have different expectations and different understandings of it and there are reasons for that across the world but I think it's important to remember the basic principle of what it stands for. Right. So it does have a very variable interpretation. I mean, if I went anywhere in the world and needed a keyhole gallbladder operation, I would probably get the same thing. But <laughs> when we're talking about a national park, it can be very, very different depending on the circumstance. What is the financial model that underpins uh, a national park, and particularly the two national parks that we have? Um, and <clears throat> by extension... Um, have the national parks and the financial model that has been in place for the two that we have, have they been successful? Um, and what do you think the financial model ought to be that would underpin a national park? Mm -hmm. And is that financial model itself politically controversial and an obstacle to their establishment? The, the model is that it National parks in Scotland are 100% funded by the Scottish Government in recognition of their national importance. So I like to say that they are nationally funded but locally controlled. Now the, the board, the authority which runs the National Park and takes the decisions and approves the National Park plan is, as I said, majority uh, local councillors and locally directly elected people, but there are also national appointees to represent that national funding and to represent the national interest. So I, I don't think the model is, is an obstacle. The actually providing the money might be, um, because obviously this would be additional expenditure, and that's for the Scottish Government to determine amongst its other priorities. I would say that we would say that it's relatively good value for money. The, the joint budget for the two existing national parks is approximately £13 million a year. Has that and been consistent throughout? Broadly, although the national park authorities are also very good at uh, adopting what they call shovel-ready pro projects, so they always have um, some projects lined up, a visitor centre they'd like to build or a... Um, you know, a village hall they'd like to do up or whatever it is and so that if the government finds some extra money towards the end of the financial year or from an unspent pot, the National Park authorities, in my experience, are the first to put up their hands and say we could spend that money to, to benefit our local area. What I would stress is in the same way as John was mentioning that future national parks would be more likely to be wholly within one local authority, they would also likely to be smaller in scale and expenditure than the two existing ones. The two existing ones are quite large and quite complex and involve arrangements to bringing together three local authorities or five local authorities. Um, the ones that we're proposing would either be wholly within an existing local authority or at the most shared between two, 
they are generally smaller in area and smaller in population, and therefore the budget is likely to be substantially less. For example, the feasibility study done in 2008 for Harris reckoned that the Harris National Park could be run on approximately £1 million a year. So just because the two existing ones are costing round about 13, although we think that's good value, please don't think that that would be the additional expenditure for every other okay. one. John? Thank you. Just to and thank you, Mr. Mayhew, for the copy of the report that you've done. Unfortunately, it did arrive in, a, in front of us as, just as we sat down. Uh, so it would be useful to actually have a good read through that. And I'd also be interested in getting a copy of the socio-economic report that you've produced in relation to national parks, just to see the benefits. Now, Jackson Carlow has asked a question about the Scottish Government funding existing funding to national parks. But during your opening remarks, you actually made reference to additional resources uh, would come into these designated areas. Are you talking about additional resources solely from the Scottish Government, or are you talking about additional resources coming in from other areas? Uh, because it would be useful to understand whether or not the designation would rely solely on Scottish Government funding being made available. Again, I'll, I'll give you a quick answer and then invite comments from my colleagues. Uh, predominantly, I was meaning additional central Scottish Government resources coming into the areas in recognition of their national importance for wildlife, landscape, recreation, tourism and so on. However, the National Park authorities, both in Scotland and elsewhere, have proved themselves adroit at putting together project funding proposals which lever in funding from elsewhere, so HLF funding or... Um, European Union funding, for example. So they're, they're quite good at doing that. So I would say that the, the national funding from the Scottish Government can act as seed corn uh, to bring in other funding. That's not unique to national parks. Obviously, I acknowledge that local authorities can do this well as well, and so can other agencies. But it certainly is something national park authorities have, have shown that they're able to do. Anything you want to add? Just perhaps a, a, a point about... Yeah sense why they're able to do it. I mean, what, what the National Park has, which a lot of other designations don't have, and this applies, for example, to geoparks, which we've got in some parts of the Highlands at the moment, is dedicated staff employed, in effect, on a permanent basis. So you've got people there who, who are in a position not only to get to know the area and its needs and the opportunities that are there, but also to go out and seek the sort of additional funding that you're, you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that is really, really critical. If you have short-term funding, as you have with quite a lot of these others, for the staff themselves, they actually spend most of their time looking, <laughs> looking for money that will actually support the continuation of their posts beyond the two or three years for which they've been appointed in the first instance. Um, actually having a small body of core staff with a reasonable degree of permanence is critical to being able to generate a lot of these wider benefits. I thank that you for that response, Mr Thompson. The, one of the reasons the Scottish Government have given to date for not creating more national parks is the financial issue in terms of revenue and capital funding and the reduction in the budget since 2008. Uh, but it would be useful to know if have there been any discussions... <coughs> with the Scottish Government about looking at, as you described it, seed corn funding uh, to allow the national parks to be created and then to allow those national parks uh, authorities to then try and seek resources from elsewhere because there are a number of charitable organisations and the big lottery and various other uh, organisations that could potentially be prepared to invest uh, and fund projects if there was a, an area designated as a national park that may lessen the financial burden on the Scottish Government and allow us to achieve what you seek to achieve in your petition? I think that's a very positive proposal. The thing which costs revenue and capital funding is the creation of the National Park Authority and the employment of staff and the finding of premises and the running it. What we're calling for at this stage is the preparation of a strategy for whether we should have more national parks and if so where they should be. And I wouldn't be so naive as to say that would cost nothing but that would cost comparatively little yeah. because it would broadly be carried out by officials in their existing staff time. 
Obviously, we see this as a priority. It's up to the Scottish Government to assess that priority against its other priorities. But the actual preparation of a strategy, which is what we see, could be done at relatively low cost and could then feed into the sort of model which you're proposing. And given the work that you've already done in this report, uh, you produced, uh, taking that forward would uh, hopefully greatly assist the Scottish Government to come to some conclusions about how the, the best way forward in creation of more national parks. Yes, we very much hope that our report will be considered as a positive contribution towards any debate in the future. Thank you. Uh, and indeed, if I may answer, the other report we've produced on the socio-economic benefits and indeed further ones which we have in the pipeline indeed. on that theme as well. Yeah. Could you, sorry Mr Miller, could you give some indication of what other reports you're referring to, because we've got this unfinished business, socio-economic, <coughs> what other reports are the in the pipeline that you know, may be of interest yeah, yeah. to the committee and to yeah. the parliament uh, and may help influence the Scottish Government to move on this, because since 1945, in terms of the Ramsey report, right through uh, to, to the present date, uh, then clearly there is a, a clear indication from the general public and the example of Harris shows that people would like to see the creation of more national parks. However, there just seems to be a reluctance, and I'm not just talking about the present government, I'm talking about previous governments, to actually move the agenda forward in Scotland. Uh, so it would be useful just to know what other reports you're intending to commission and take forward uh, that would help assist in the debate, in the wider debate, and getting the national parks established. Indeed. Um, we, we would stand by unfinished business as our principal yeah. report and the main summary of our case. What we've been doing since is thinking about, should we call them subsidiary topic papers or issues papers on particular aspects of the debate. The one about socio-economic benefits is the first one, and I will make that available to all of you. The other two that we are considering uh, publishing is one about governance models and one about the importance of national parks for the tourism industry. So those are the two issues, governance and tourism. What we're trying to do with the governance one is unpick to a certain extent what we've been talking about, about possible models for national parks. A national park in Scotland does not have to have a £10 million budget, 50 staff and a board of 23 people. It could have a £1 million budget, five staff and a board which is a subcommittee of a local authority. It would still be a national park under the 2000 and Act act because that's so flexible. So we're going to be putting that forward. Um, and also we're particularly keen to stress the tourism benefits which national parks bring, both the, the job creation and the financial benefits to the area, but also the benefits in terms of providing a service to visitors to Scotland. Could I perhaps add that, that although we haven't got a firm plan for it at the moment, one of the other areas that we think we, we might wish to cover is, is the role of national parks in planning based on the experience of existing national parks, both in Scotland and elsewhere, because there is this perception um, that your chances of getting permission for a development in a national park is significantly lower than elsewhere. Well, that isn't actually borne out by the experience. The experience suggests that the success rate is pretty much the same and possibly even a bit better in a national park. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean to say that you get permission for quite what you might get permission for elsewhere because there's a role for the National Park in guiding people who have got developments in mind to try and make sure that they're of a quality and character that's appropriate to the park. Thank you. Ken? Yeah. It's been suggested that uh, almost all of Scotland could be a national park and you've suggested an additional seven. Do you think... Firstly, that there's an optimum or maximum number of national parks that can exist. And secondly, do you see any detrimental aspects to areas either adjacent or perhaps equally scenic that aren't or wouldn't be classified as national parks? We feel that up to seven is the answer, which is why we've put these seven forward. But one more would be wonderful. So if you could argue that uh, the, the, the place which always comes up in all the expert reports and hasn't yet been designated is the kind of Ben Nevis, Glencoe, Black Mount area, 
Um, you could also argue there's a strong case for having a national park in the south of Scotland because this is not a Highlands and Islands issue, it is a Scotland-wide issue, so that would point towards Galloway or the Cheviots. You could argue that the place where there's clear, proven local support is Harris, and therefore that should have the first choice. So I could make a case for any one of the, the seven areas. In terms of the maximum number, yes, there will come a point at which the benefits we've described cease to apply. So we, we certainly feel that you could bring additional benefits to those places with more, but the argument against designating the whole of Scotland or the whole of the North West as a national park is it would dilute those benefits so much as to be not worth doing in the first place. So uh, we would say, we, we have said at least seven, so we wouldn't rule out any more, um, but we say that's heading towards the maximum number, otherwise you're starting to lose the benefits which I've identified. The issue of areas around uh, the national parks is crucial to them and to other designated areas, and it is possible to think of examples where if a national park, for example, excludes particular types of development which it feels are inappropriate, those are more likely to take place around the national park. Uh, you could also argue, and there's been studies in the north of England which, which have shown this, is that national parks bring benefits to places which are just outside them. So people may stay in towns or villages which are outside the national park, but um, do their cycling or their walking or their fishing or, to, or their golf or whatever they want to do within the national park, that brings benefits not just within the boundary but to what you might call the gateway communities as well. So um, once you start designating any area for anything, you immediately come up with boundary issues. But if we accept, as we have as a society, that some places are more special for others than others for their landscape or for their wildlife or for their cultural heritage, then it's more important to designate those areas and to manage them positively um, than it is to worry about the boundary effects. I think you, you have to tackle the boundary effects and certainly the existing national park authorities I know have been working with communities just out with their boundaries uh, in order to make sure that the disadvantages are minimised, but I think the advantages outweigh any of those disadvantages. Could, could I maybe chip in with a couple of comments there? I mean, the first one relating to how many, whether there's a ceiling. Um, I think perhaps it's better to think not so much in terms of the number of parks, but of the sort of proportion of the land area of the country. And that's going back to something John said, I think, in his introductory remarks. Um, and I think it is generally recognised that the landscapes of Scotland are by international standards of a very high quality. And therefore, I think you would expect at least the same sort of proportion as is designated in Wales to be of national park quality and deserving status. And if you put the, the national parks together with the areas of outstanding natural beauty in Wales, which are of similar landscape quality, they've got slightly different arrangements for management, you're talking about round about 25%. And funnily enough, it's actually similar in England. So I think it would be not unreasonable to say, well, something like a quarter is, is, a, is a fair sort of, not necessarily a target to be aiming for, but the sort of amount you might be considering. The second point is really building on what John was saying about the surrounding areas. If you have national parks dotted quite widely around the country, as we're proposing, to reach them, people are going to have to travel through lots of other parts of the country. And when they do that, they'll realise just how good these other parts are. So actually having magnets dotted around like that is actually a way of promoting the rest of the country as well. Mr Thompson, just in that last response to Mr McCaskill, you talked about the management structures in Wales. Uh, did I pick you up correctly saying that the management structures in Wales are different from the management structures in Scotland for the national parks? Uh, not for the national parks. Uh, I think there are marginal differences, but they're essentially the same. No, it's the areas of the outstanding natural beauty which are more equivalent to our national scenic areas, which have different arrangements. They, they are more clearly locally government, local government controlled. Right. Um, uh, and, but they do have real management structures, which is something that we don't have in the National Scenic Areas in Scotland, with the exception of the three 
in Dumfries and Galloway, and that is something for which we are currently being quite heavily criticised by some of the international organisations who are concerned with these things. Thank you. The, uh, the, Scot the Scottish Government has said that they have no current plans to designate further national parks in Scotland. Do you think that's because you've been unable to convince them that, uh, that national parks should be seen as opportunities and, and not as obstacles? Or do you think you, you may have some other work that you need to do? Um, I really wish I knew why the, the Scottish Government doesn't want to designate more national parks because obviously we're very committed and very passionate ab ab about the subject. Um, clearly we've not managed to convince them and we will carry on trying to do so because that's what campaigning organisations do. Um, but I think it would be worth hearing from them why, why they haven't uh, agreed to do so. The, the most recent reasons that we've heard, and I think you'll have seen this in your notes, are um, concerns about the financial uh, commitments, and that's a matter for government priorities, for uh, government spending. Obviously, we think this is a priority. Um, and the other one is not wishing to raise expectations in a wider areas that... Uh, in a, a process whereby not everywhere will end up being a national park. And we feel that raising expectations is a good thing for government to do. If you're raising expectations of something positive happening, that's good. And that doesn't, I think most people understand that if expectations are raised about something happening, it might not happen in every area. So we, we, we don't think either of those are, are good reasons for failing to move forward. But clearly we have work to do in carrying on uh, trying to persuade them, which is why we submitted the petition and sought support for it and why we're very pleased to be able to discuss it with you. Angus? Just picking up on, on your last question, um, I think uh, it's, it's um, maybe worth pointing out that in the most recent chamber debate, uh, which was in May last year, um, the Scottish Government's most recent statement suggested that it's preferable to concentrate on the, the two existing uh, national parks, given the current financial climate. Um, however, they, they didn't rule out a further designation in the future. Um, now, I'm re just skimming through your unfinished business document, and in, in section 6, um, you state that um, in 2009, the Scottish Government announced that it would establish a ministerially chaired uh, national park strategy group, um, which hasn't materialised yet. Have you had any indication from Scottish Government why that hasn't happened yet? I'm sorry, we haven't. All we know is uh, what, what I think is in one of the notes which the clerks helpfully provided to you, which was in 2010, the Minister replied that the group's establishment had been delayed until after the next spending review. Yeah, that's so right, that is in there, yeah. We haven't heard anything since then. Okay. Any further questions? Well, could I therefore ask the committee what action they would uh, seek to take on this petition? Yeah, I'm to ascertain um, why the Scottish Government has not actually taken any action, uh, despite a manifesto commitment, but more importantly, um, what is it that's stopping the Scottish Government participating? Um, I'm, I'm not wanting to uh, criticise the Government, but I think this is a very important issue, and uh, we really need to try and find ways of moving forward. And if it means the Scottish Government has an issue in terms of resourcing such a thing, then perhaps if we can explore possibilities of finding that resource elsewhere and allow uh, volunteer groups to actually assist the government in, uh, in identifying those sources so that we can actually physically move this forward. I think to drag the, our feet for this length of time is is, uh, is unhelpful at, at best. John? Could I also agree uh, that we write to Scottish Government to find out what's happening, but in particular, convener, a couple of issues, that we actually asked specifically what happened to the National Park Strategy Group, because it was part of the recommendations uh, from 2009. Uh, so it would be useful to get an, an indication that we're now six years on from that to find out where the Scottish Government are with that. I would also like to bring right to the Scottish Government to ask them about the sustainability of the national park, existing national park areas. Uh, because if it is an issue about revenue and capital funding, 
then it would be useful to get an indication from the Scottish Government about how, what they view as sustainable developments uh, in the sustainable future of the National Parks Authorities in Scotland, because clearly some of the evidence we've heard today where you could actually set up a national park for, based on Mr Mayhew's figures of a million pounds, clearly is a, a lot less than uh, the 13 million that's been spent in the national parks at the present time. But I also think we should write to a number of organisations who may be interested and assist us take this debate forward. Those would include, and I'll declare an interest in a couple of these uh, the organisations, Scottish Wildlife Trust, John Muir Trust, the RSPB, National uh, Farmers Union Scotland and the Scottish Landowners Association because I think they all have a role and as well as many others in actually trying to determine and identify what would be the best use of existing uh, areas uh, to, turn, to be designated as national parks. Uh, because I think, and it goes back to my earlier point, convener, that a number of these organisations can bring resources with them uh, and additional resources over and above what the Scottish Government may be asked to contribute would, I think, help uh, deliver more national parks in Scotland. Any other member get any? Uh, could I, therefore, maybe agree that we write on the points that have been raised? And uh, could I also maybe add that we also write to the Scottish National Heritage, the Campaign for National Parks and the Association for the Protection of Rural Scotland? We could also suggest that we may write to the Rural Committee, uh, just to keep them advised and informed as to this petition here. Members agreed? OK, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Mayhew, Mr Thompson and Mr Muller for attending. And uh, I will now suspend for a couple of minutes for a changeover. The next petition today is PE1562 by Alan McLean on perverse acquittal. Uh, members have a note by the clerk and a spice briefing. And may I welcome the petitioner, uh, Alan McLean, to this meeting. He is accompanied by Steve Kicker. And, uh, and I now invite Mr McLean to speak to his petition. No more than five minutes. And then uh, and to explain what your petition seeks, and we'll then move to questions. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, ladies and gents. Uh, I would like to bring this information to your attention. Uh, as some of you may be aware, we lost our precious son on May the 28th, 2011, due to knife crime, which is every parent's worst nightmare, as no parent should outlive their child, especially to knife crime. The devastation, the everlasting pain and emptiness will remain with us for the rest of our life. This change to our normal family life has been forced upon us due to someone else's intent, actions and wrong choice. This can happen at any time, anywhere and to anyone. Since our tragic loss, we have focused our energies and built a strong anti-knife crime self-funded campaign team who have campaigned endlessly for tougher sentencing. The anti-knife crime message has been taken into many primary and secondary schools in Fife, 
With the support of Police Scotland to hopefully change the mindset and raise awareness on the consequences and impact of night crime to our younger generations. As the father of a murdered son who never received any form of justice for the loss of her son, I took a personal interest due to her own personal devastating circumstances and experience in the subject of perverse acquittal. With the support of my colleague Steph Ke Steve Kecker, who is our anti knife crime campaign chairman, to explore avenues and see what we could do to propose positive improvements within our current system. The proposal, there should be a limited exception to the rule that a jury verdict of acquittal in any criminal case be treated as final in any murder case and possibly also in cases involving other serious crimes where the judge, after consultation with the counsel, comes to the view in the light of all the evidence that an acquittal was perverse he or she should have the power to request that the Court of Appeal reviews the case. A perverse acquittal is one that no reasonable jury could have reached on the evidence before it. If the Court of Appeal reviews a case and decides that a retrial is warranted, then should the retrial consist of a jury, as there may be similar reoccurrences, or should the retrial consist of a panel of judges? The judge operates on the basis of a reasonable doubt about the jury's verdict. The proposed perverse acquittal will provide a new control measure for judges, although the judge's word is final on the law and the jury's word is final on the facts. This process would only be used by the judge when he or she thinks that the verdict is not just simply wrong, but actually perverse and has the power to intervene and forward the case to the High Court of Judiciary. The perverse acquittal proposal is perfectly consistent with the, with the proposal that the criminal justice system continues to acknowledge that if the jury system is to have meaning and value, then jury decisions must be respected when they seem wrong as well as when they seem right. Further, far from opening a set of floodgates to innumerable challenges, the proposal is highly restricted. For example, perverse acquittal should only apply to the most serious of crimes, quite possibly only to where a life has been taken. These are acquittal verdicts that no reasonable jury could have brought in the evidence before it. Some may doubt what might otherwise seem common sense, namely that the more serious the crime, the more compelling the reasons to ensure that the outcome is right, both procedurally and substantively. The overriding objective must be to convict the guilty and acquit the innocent, for example, where the perpetrator has admitted to the crime and there is overwhelming evidence to support the case. However, it seems hard to argue against the view that from a public interest point of view, evidence that very serious criminals have wrongly escaped conviction may indicate dangers to the public and may shake the public's confidence in the system. The jury is an essential part of the legal system which evolved, as we know, approximately the 15th century and, and has remained with us to current day. The fact that the jury has stood the test of time has given society a feeling of acceptance that this is the best way to decide on the outcome of indictable offences. But as previously stated, sometimes the jury gets it right and sometimes they get it wrong as well. Our current system has a responsibility to ensure that the truth, trust, and most importantly, common sense prevails at the end of the day. Our current jury selection process is basically like a lottery, where the selection criteria only has three requirements for selecting jurors. One, the person's name must be on the electoral roll register. Secondly, the person must be aged between 18 and 70. And third, the person must have lived in the UK for five years since their 13th birthday. These people are selected under the mentioned criteria, which is totally down to chance. There is a realistic possibility that incompetent people, people who are unable to deal with the court atmosphere, people with learning difficulties who may not be able to absorb legal information throughout the court proceedings, also people who may have disabilities, for example, deafness, they may not hear what's been discussed. These people may be selected for jury service. How can the system guarantee 
that individuals selected for jury service are adequate to perform the role as a juror. Again, we have a gap that needs filled. Surely a suitability test would be required to ensure that individuals meet a specific criteria or possibly a pre-trial pre discussion to be held by a clerk or clerks of the court with the jurors who will be able to provide a general capability assessment of each juror. Moreover, it scarcely needs saying that there is a strong and now well-recognised public interest in ensuring that perpetrators of serious crimes are not wrongfully acquitted at trial. The proposal for perverse acquittal would fill a small but important gap in the protection provided by law against wrongful acquittals. In fact, the proposal does not advocate a simple merits-based procedure for overturning acquittals. The proposal is perfectly consistent with the proposal that the criminal justice system continues to acknowledge that if the jury system is to have meaning and value, jury decisions must be respected when they seem wrong as well as when they seem right. Some supporting information that you have from SPICE as well, convener. The Scottish Parliament Information Centre, SPICE, and the Crown Office, have, we have been in contact with them. They have came back and gave us information regarding acquittals by juries. We asked if there had been any research conducted to address the issue relating to perverse acquittals. They stated that they are not aware of any work which had been done in relation to the issue of perverse acquittals by juries. They also note that there is no right of appeal by the prosecution against the decision of a jury. Surely to maintain fairness and balance in a trial, there should be the right of appeal available to both the prosecution and the defence. We have also mentioned in previous conversations uh, regarding uh, Barry's law when we, when we initially first submitted the petition. And we also requested that if the proposal for perverse acquittal is accepted by the committee and by the parliament, as a new section of leg legislation within the Criminal Bill Act, we would like to request it to be known as Barry's Law, which would not only be our late son's legacy, but would have meaning to so many people who support anti-knife crime within our communities, towns and cities. Again, legally, it may be known as the Criminal Justice and Victims Act, but that will be for the lawyers to decide upon the title. This is a similar process to as everyone well knows, Sarah's Law for the Disclosure of Residences of sex Sexual Offenders. Some other finalising brief points. Clearly, clearly, the precise procedure contemplated by the proposal is not the only possible procedure. A number of variations are possible. For example, it might be left to the Lord Advocate or Attorney General to refer allegedly perverse acquittals to the Court of Appeal rather than the trial judge. Alternatively, it may be that the High Court is the right body to hear such referrals. Suitability tests or pre-trial discussions for jurors to ensure that a specific criteria or competency has been achieved by all potential jurors, which will ensure that we have a watertight system. Equally clearly, it is highly desirable that an acquitted defendant is not left in doubt for any longer than necessary about the validity of the acquittal verdict. The time period for the trial judge, the Lord Advocate or Attorney General, to challenge a verdict on the grounds that it is perverse should be short. Ideally, some indication that this is being considered should be given quickly following the verdict. However, it would not seem appropriate for any decision to be announced in open court immediately following the jury's verdict. And finally, to finalise, hopefully this opening statement will provide supporting information from our perspective as regards our proposals and objectives to provide a watertight, equal and fair system for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McLean. And, and uh, before we move into questions, could I, probably on behalf of the committee, just offer our condolences at the, 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 the tragic loss of your son. Questions? Mr McCaskill. Thanks, convener. Mr McLean, it's nice to see you again. Uh, obviously, as you've alluded to, jury research is basically non-existent. It's always been viewed as sacrosanct, but uh, Lord Bonamy, who's been carried out, carrying out uh, a review into safeguards in the event of the removal of corroboration, has called for such research. Is that something you would support? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're aware that Dame Elish Angelini, the former Lord Advocate, at a lecture back in February, I think, 
made various comments that I think you've touched upon and you might want to, to, to add to it. She warned that little is known about the challenges, challenges conditions such as dyslexia, dysgraphia and dyscalculia posed for jurors sitting through court trials and subsequently how verdicts are reached. I think that ties in with the comments you made about who we select and the criteria. Is that, again, something that you would support? Absolutely us? support it. You know, I think when you're looking to, to implement something like this, that there may be a cost involved, but again, you know, the, the cost shouldn't come against mm -hmm. uh, such things as that. Yeah, absolutely. We would absolutely support that 100%, yes. Uh, Finally, I think we've both looked at the SPICE mm. research, and I did see that there was a, uh, a law in Canada, but it did seem that the appeal in Canada was based on an error in point of law and direction by the judge to the jury, not on, on simply an assumption of perversity. The devil and the law is always in the detail. Have you any idea how we would define perversity to be able to justify an appeal. Right. Um, uh, thank you. Um, if, if I could just set the scene just a little bit and, and understand um, uh, the convener's point um, uh, regarding Alan's uh, circumstances. Um, to be a bit more uh, brutal and a bit more clearer on Alan's circumstances, um, <coughs> hell looks quite comfortable when you compare it with what he's been through. So that, that's where we are. And what we've recognised in uh, Alan's personal circumstances is <clears throat> there's a, there, there is a gap that, 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 we, that we believe needs closed. And um, the, the level of perversity is when something is, or when a judge believes something is unjust. Now, <clears throat> when uh, a defendant sits in court uh, and says nothing, but through uh, uh, tapes uh, has admitted uh, a crime, a murder crime, uh, and walks free from court, there's something sadly wrong. And, and if, I, if I could quote um, Lord Justice Auld, he put it, a criminal trial is not a game under which a guilty defendant should be provided with a sporting chance. It is a search for the truth in accordance with uh, uh, prosecution principles. The object being is to convict the guilty and acquit the innocent. The guilty, in the case of Alan's case, um, walked free. He was acquitted. Um, so the, 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 there is an unjustness about that and, and, and I believe, and Alan believes, and our whole campaign team believes that that gap needs to be closed. Now, um, I wasn't at court at the, 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 the at Barry's trial. I can understand that, you know, your petition here is based on something that's happened. But yes, did. We really can't go back into the detail of, of what happened previously. Yes. So if you could maybe just stick to, you know, your, your petition and, uh, you know, dealing with the perverse acquittal. Uh, Mr McCaskill has already identified, you know, a uh, stuff from Lord Bonamy and mentioned Dame Angelino. Could I maybe ask a question out with, you know, what, what, what may be happening in the future, but it's regards to what you, Mr, McCle uh, Mr. McLean, believe is to what extent might this proposal in your petition be seen by some as potentially undermining the jury system in Scotland? After all, it's regarded as an important facet to our judicial system. I think the long percentage, uh, as far as perverse acquittal, is, is very, a very small percentage. Let's be truthful. You know, most convictions go through the courts, go in the right, in the correct direction. So th there is a small gap there, as we previous, previously said. There will be criticism, there will be a small percentage who oppose it, but I think in the long run, as far as from the from the, the, the government's perspective, or the parliament, the justice system, we need to make sure that we do have a foolproof system in place. And you know, that where the perverse acquittals have came out, uh, and they're evident, I think that we need to make sure as one, just that one team approach, that yeah, nobody's going to actually slip through, but we're actually trying to 
put the proposal in place to make sure that we have a, a new platform, a new safety net there for judges, because it has been proved that somebody can defeat beyond the purpose of the justice system. So that safety net needs to be in place there to give our, our judges that control measure. And I think that would also, to sort of snowball onto that, it would uh, echo the message out into the public to say, you know, these relevant changes are in place, you will not beat the, the justice system. So that may add as a, an additional deterrent into the public eye, which would be a positive move forward. Jackson. Good morning. Good morning. I, I've been listening to all this carefully, yes. and, and I'm, I'm undecided in my own mind, actually, which is fine. But yes. I, how would you? I mean, I I'm in very little doubt that there will be guilty people who have been found innocent, and innocent people who have been found guilty. It's one of the principal reasons why many people like myself uh, decided uh, event against the whole concept of capital punishment because we know. Uh, in hindsight, that innocent people were executed for crimes that it then transpired they had not committed. So it works both ways. But essentially, if the argument is simply that the prosecution ultimately failed to prove its case, mm -hmm. uh, would such a system not simply, A, potentially lead to a lack of rigour from the prosecution over time going forward, in the knowledge that they could then seek to lobby the judge for a second chance. Mm -hmm. And is all of that not really ultimately undesirable compared to simply a more rigorous examination of the argument in respect of a prosecution and the pursuit of it in the first place? I think there's certain aspects there, sir. Uh, you know, a percentage, the root cause of this may be uh, to look at the jury system, the process, the selection. No, I, I accept that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I accept, I said, in yeah. some ways I felt the arguments you were making, and which yes. Mr McCaskill touched upon, uh -huh. about the whole process yeah. of jury selection were almost a petition in themselves. Yeah. Um, but the actual petition we're being asked to consider here is that the, the, the prospect of an extension of the um, open charge against mm -hmm. an accused. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, <coughs> I think the, um, the I've, I've lost my train of thought here. Um, I think when there's sufficient evidence here, there's clear and substantial amount of evidence. But you see, that seems rather a subjective criteria. I mean, do you therefore envisage that a perfectly innocent man mm -hmm. who is found innocent... Um, but for whom it may be deemed that the evidence suggested otherwise, mm -hmm. would remain in custody mm -hmm. during the process of an appeal and the possibility of a further trial, which could ultimately find him innocent again. Mm -hmm. That... Yeah, no. yeah, th 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 that, that, that's a possibility, go. but, but oh. surely um, the, the, we, we, we're, we're testing that law to, to, the, to the extreme almost. I mean, what, what, what we're doing is we're allowing, in some cases, uh, monsters to walk around the streets. That's, that's, what, that's what's happening by wrongful acquittals. Um, what we want to do is try and, uh, to close that gap. And yes, there is a risk that we, we do send people back for retrial and, and they're found innocent again. However, this would be limited only in the, in the most serious crime, which is murder, uh, in our view. Uh, <coughs> and, and, and we believe that that opportunity to, uh, given to the judge to allow what he or she believes is perverse and unjust to, to refer to an appeals court. Further review. OK. John. Convener, uh, good morning, Mr McLean. And I, I'm trying to get my head around this issue as well, because what potentially could be argued is that trial by jury would be cease in relation to, and what you've, the definition you've used, is most serious crimes. Uh, so the argument, and I'll put it to you, is could be presented, then why go through a jury trial if it's a serious crime? Uh, because you might get a perverse acquittal as your definition, which undermines, in many respects, the existing judicial system that we have in Scotland and that 
It's then down to who would make the decision about whether or not that was defined as a serious crime. And I know murder is a serious crime, but who would that... Because there are other aspects, and some people would argue that there are other serious crimes that take place that may be subject to perverse acquittal. At what stage do you think, and do you stop uh, the, you know, taking cases to jury trial? Uh, because effectively all you're doing and potentially doing is actually repeating the same evidence being given in front of a jury or in front of a judge. And surely the argument would be, well, let's just do away with jury trial and just let's have uh, judges sitting in the most serious of cases. That would be an ideal world, sir. It may yeah. appear to be an ideal yeah. world, but what I'm saying to you yeah. is that currently it would undermine mm. the fabric of our judicial system at the present moment. The, the expectation that an individual who is found, uh, who is charged and is taken to court currently has the right to have that case heard in front of a jury. Uh, and as I said, the, my view at the present moment is there's a fine line mm -hmm. to say whether or not a serious crime should actually be heard in front of a jury or should just be heard by a judge. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's that issue, and it's, it goes back to, I think, a, a couple of members have made reference to who would then make, and the, what you're saying is... Uh, a judge would, or the Lord Advocate and yeah. the Solicitor General, I think you indicated, mm -hmm. would have the right to make application for perverse acquittal if an individual was to walk. And is it walk free or walk away from a court with a lesser charge than murder? And it's trying to get that just oh. clar clarification, Mr mm -hmm. McLean. Yeah. Because not everybody who has taken forward for murder actually ends up being found guilty of murder. They may have maybe be found guilty of a lesser charge. And would you say that potentially would then lead to a perverse acquittal or a perverse decision by a jury in relation to the decisions that are made by a jury trial? I think only where a, a decision is made that they've been acquitted and there's clear evidence, clear substantial overwhelming evidence there that they have committed the crime. But you understand that in terms yes. of the, the difference between a murder trial mm -hmm. and, some of the, and the sentence that may be passed down uh, in a murder trial compared to that of uh, some other, a lesser charge, maybe a, a lesser term of imprisonment uh, or, a le or yeah. potentially a fine mm -hmm. uh, being imposed. Uh, and at that stage, would there be the possibility in your mind that the, there could be further action in terms of a, not perverse acquittal, but a perverse decision mm -hmm. being reached by a jury. Uh, the, the, I mean, the, uh, I think some of the bits that you touched on are, um, uh, are quite fragile in terms of, of the law because the, the, there is a strong argument. I remember reading something, I, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago regarding some um, financial uh, uh, institutions uh, taken to court and there was a, a, a debate about um, the, 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 the complex nature of the trial that no reasonable jury could, could understand mm -hmm. the, the intricacies of that, of that trial and you know the, the, there may well be a strong case for uh, serious crimes to be um, uh, W w without a jury, uh, you know, by a panel of judges, um, as you uh, as you perhaps uh, were alluding to, but um, you know, if if in my mind, if if a decision is unjust, and by virtue is is, is perverse, um, an appeals court uh, made up of a panel of judges makes that final de decision on whether or not that 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 case goes for retrial. Or, or doesn't, and in the case of a retrial, it would be a new jury. Kenny, 
some duties because clearly they have sacrosanct in the kind of common law system in the United Kingdom. You see different situations, for example, in South Africa with Oscar Pistorius, but the situation certainly in Scotland and south of the border, other than Lockerbie that sat with uh, judges as opposed to a jury, has been uh, that it should go to a jury of your peers. There have been changes down in England and Wales, basically to deal with cases where there may be threats or intimidation towards the jurors. And I have to say, I've always been very sympathetic to such cases and the complexity also of some major frauds. But the situation in England and Wales is more those cases where the jury may be tampered with or intimidated, not uh, uh, on any other criteria. The people who have been most opposed to any change in Scotland have actually been the Crown. And I just wondered on your views about why and how you would want to go further than perhaps what many, including myself, are sympathetic to in England and Wales, that some, sometimes we have to probably protect the jury. I know the jury's been, uh, been a process for many hundreds of years. Uh, and, you know, some of the questions when we've been debating this at our, our anti knife and campaign meetings is, you know, is it time for, do we need a change within our current justice system? Uh, I think what you're saying is absolutely right. We, we need to, to give the public interest within the jury system to make it fair and equal. Uh, but I think when you've actually experienced something and you're putting a proposal forward to the government, and the main objective of this is to hopefully close that small gap and prevent this devastation happening to another family. And that's the main objective of this, is to close that small gap. If I could come on also, I, 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 I don't think the, the, the general public um, think it's good enough um, for <coughs> a, a murder case um, to be, um, or there to be a wrongful acquittal and um, someone to say, well, that's just how it is, that's the law. Uh, I don't think the general public <coughs> believe that's the right thing. I think the right thing is that, that we've identified what we believe is a gap in the law and, and we're looking at ways that we can perhaps close that to make it a better law. Uh, we're in the 21st century and I think some of those laws need to be brought uh, into the 21st century. And where we have got... Um, um, monsters, in my view, um, walking around the street because of wrongful acquittals, um, there's something not right. And I think, or I believe, that we need to put that right. And, and this is perhaps um, one s small step and vehicle to try and uh, secure that. There are no further questions. Could I then ask the committee what action that we be prepared to? Ms McCaskill? We should be writing to the government. I think Mr McLean and Mr Keeker, in very tragic circumstances, have raised an issue that uh, actually has also been raised, uh, fortunately or otherwise, by Lord uh, Bonamy, uh, which is that we need some research into jurors. I don't think anybody, and certainly not Mr McLean or Mr Keeker, are suggesting that we should perhaps have the American situation of people coming out of a jury room and then almost signing a TV contract. But we do need to know more about how and why uh, decisions are made. So my first suggestion is that we should go to the government to say what are they going to do about Lord Bonamy's comments. If they're going to take it forward then clearly additional letters that we would write to other legal parties such as the faculty and the law society are probably unnecessary. So first and foremost I think it's are we going to see Lord Bonamy's uh, uh, desire and indeed, I think it's shared uh, by Mr McLean and Mr Keeker, delivered on and get some research into jurors, which would then allow us to work out what we need to do. Is there any other points, yeah. Anjana? Uh, just a comment. I mean, I, I have to be honest and say that, uh, Mr McLean, I'm, I'm not totally uh, convinced one way or the other with your presentation today, whilst I appreciate the... The, the passion that you have and you want to see a better system. And as far as that goes, I would agree with you. Uh, I think there are uh, potential jurors who have various difficulties uh, and perhaps are not fit for jury duty. One of them that comes to my mind immediately is language difficulties. We have 
over 150 new communities in Scotland today, and many of them don't have as clear an English uh, skill that one would hope a juror would have. That's just one example. And I, so I agree that there needs to be some sort of investigation and a study into that system. So I'm quite happy for uh, us to approach the, the government uh, to see uh, what action, if any, we can take. Um, and I would suggest that we, we continue this uh, your proposal and see how we, how we can develop that um, because I don't have the answer but I'm sure like Kenny McCaskill who's a lawyer himself and many others I'm sure they'll be able to give us some good advice and guidance in the future and to, to take this to the next stage. John. I agree with Kenny McCaskill's point about writing to the Scottish Government to get their views on the Bonamy uh, recommendations that are proposals that have been put forward but could I suggest we also write to the Scottish Human Rights Commission uh, to get some views, to, because it would be useful to get early views uh, from the Scottish Human Rights Commission as to the issues raised in this petition. Because I, I think, uh, and I think I was trying to express earlier, it does have a number of implications if we move forward, and we need to be clear about the implications of any changes in the current legislation and the way to, we deal with uh, trial uh, and jury trial uh, has to be resolved. And, but as, as I said, at the present moment, I suggest we write to the Human Rights Commission as well, just to get a, 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 a view, yeah. uh, or give them an he early heads up that we require a view from them on this issue. Um, I'm just conscious that some of the actions that we are um, now writing about fall out with the scope of the core petition, which is on the desirability of the perverse uh, direction uh, and the potential extension of trial. So I would sort of, I think, add to the list of people we're writing to those recommended to us by the clerks, the Crown Office, Procurator, Fiscal Service, Faculty of Agates, Judges of the High Court of Judiciary, etc., on the actual principle underpinning the petition, which is to consider the need for trial judges to have the power to refer jury verdicts to High Court of Judiciary over and above the actual examination issues about the competencies of juries, which I think almost I don't see within the context of the petition itself, although they've been touched on in the dialogue that we've had. Might I then agree to the action points that's been raised? Yep. Right, thank you. Can I thank you, Mr. McLean and, and Mr. Kiker, for, for your attendance, and uh, we'll now adjourn for a minute for a changeover. Thank you. I think must be. The final petition today is PE1 treble 5 by Siobhan Gary on the electric shock and vibration calls for animals. Members have a note by the clerk in a spice briefing. 
And uh, may I welcome Petitioner Siobhan, uh, Siobhan and uh, who's accompanied by Claire Staines, a dog trainer and behavioralist. And uh, so I now invite you, Siobhan, to speak to your petition for no more than five minutes, uh, explain what your petition seeks, and then we'll move to questions. Yeah, good morning. Thanks, everybody, for having us today. Um, our petition um, is asking the Scottish Government to ban the use of shock collars in animals, namely, namely dogs. Um, we believe that electric shock collars um, don't have the governance they should have. Um, there's very poor legislation for them. They cause psychological distress, severe anxiety, emotional harm and indisplaced aggression. And there is an alternative with positive reinforcement and appropriate training um, that doesn't deliver via cruel methods. Um, electric shock collars um, are already banned um, in Wales. They were banned there a couple of years ago. They're also banned in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Austria, Germany, Switzerland, Slovenia and many Australian states with petitions in several other countries um, for a ban underway. Um, the ban is also supported by the Scottish SPCA, the Scottish Kennel Club, Guide Dogs for the Blind, Dogs Trust, the RSPCA, Advocates for Animals, PETA, the Association of Animal Behaviourists, um, and the majority of dog breeding clubs as well. Um, there are several dangers um, with electric shock collars, um, some of which are that the remote collars of the shock collars can fall into the hands of children who find amusement in shocking pets for no reason because they're too young to know better. There's also the danger of the collars being misused by cruel people who take pleasure in hurting animals. The collars have been known to cause burns on pets and severe disfigurement. And shock collars can be misused by putting them on other animals. The smaller the animal, the more pain the collars will cause. And in small animals, which the collars are not suitable, they can cause death. Due to the lack of governance um, and legislation, um, there are several things that can go horribly wrong. One example is that a Labrador Retriever's owners bought an electric shock collar from a leading pet shop and carefully read all the instructions. The product was designed to work outdoors as it was one of the shock collars that was designed to act like an invisible electric fence. The owner left the dog in the backyard for a few hours, but was alarmed when he returned home to find him in pain. On carefully removing the collar, the owner was horrified to find horrific burns on the dog's neck. The device had shocked the dog non-stop for several hours and, had, and the dog had to have emergency vet treatment under a general anaesthetic and suturing for the holes in his neck. Wales is the first constituent country in the UK to ban shock collars, agreeing with the RSPCA that their use is a form of animal cruelty. Um, they enforce that in law by a fine of up to £20,000 or six months in prison. And the law, sadly, is very poorly enforced, but they are improving on that. Um, we believe that there are more humane ways to stop dog barking, which is an issue for a lot of, a lot of pet owners. Um, there are kinder ways to do it, using positive reinforcement. Alternatives include collars that spray citronella, that dogs detest the smell of, and collars that emit a high-pitched noise, which is unpleasant for them to hear. Excess barking is one reason why many people abandon their dog. There may be other reasons for the dog's behaviour. The majority of the time, the behaviour can be remedied with the assistance of training and humane training aids, which is where Claire comes in. Um, these are aids such as ones designed to keep the dog stimulated and occupied while the owners are out and to discourage barking. 
There's also an argument that electric shock collars are effective by some in breaking up dog fights. This is not recommended as it will actually fuel aggression in a dog. This is because the dog who is already flooded with adrenaline um, and in fight mode will believe it is the other dog inflicting the pain on them and will retaliate harder as a result. Um, I have an email here from Mike Flynn, the um, superintendent of the SSPCA, that states the Scottish SPA, uh, SPCA strongly oppose the use of shock collars and if an animal physically suffers through the use of such a device, then action should be taken. At the minute, our animal welfare governance um, is run and moderated by a charity. Um, and today our aim is to ask uh, the Scottish Government um, to implement in law something more supportive um, that will benefit animal welfare. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Ms Garricky. Uh, by way of, of questions, could I perhaps ask you what information do you have and how widely uh, these electric cars are used in Scotland? In Scotland, yeah. In Scotland, there's approximately 50,000 shock collars used at the minute. 25% um, inflict pain or suffering of some sort. There's, there's evidence um, to, to um, support that, compared to less than 5% of animals um, that, through positive reinforcement, um, you know, are, are, are affected um, are affected in some negative ways. So, 25% of animals that, that, that use shock collars um, out of that 50,000, which is a substantial amount, um, have some kind of physical or psychological effect from them. I have here on a study done, done on 133 dogs that 3.3% of the owners were using remote control activated e collars. Yeah. Just. Just for the record, uh, Siobhan, could you perhaps advise us where you get that figure from? Yeah, there was a study done um, in 2007. It was actually a Scottish Government study. Mine's is done from the Br British Vet School Research 2006. Yeah. That was, that was nearly eight years ago. You don't have any more up-to-date figures? Of figure, it's very difficult because the, the shock collars themselves, the electronic collars themselves, are non-regulated, so it's, it's very difficult to see the exact numbers. Also, they're sold in so many different places across online, etc., that it's difficult to get an exact number of how many there are. I will say from a professional point of view, I'm seeing an increase in the use of them. Um, for various different reasons, and I don't know why. Uh, the, the, the thing that I would like to do is try and put a cap on that so that they don't become more popular. As it stands just now, it's still relatively small numbers in the grand scale of things. But what we do want to do is just get the message out to dog owners that these are inhumane. They are, they are painful. They're, desi they're very designed as to be aversive. And uh, there is an alternative. So why would you use something that's designed to be aversive when it's not necessary? Right. There's an estimated, um, according to um, Cara Hilton, MSP's research, there's an estimated 500,000 dog owners across the UK using shock collars. Um, they deliver an electric shock lasting up to 30 seconds. Um, and her evidence um, states that three out of four Scots are against electric collars. Okay. Any other questions? Jackson? Um, yes, thank you. It's not, I, I don't have dogs, never had dogs, so it's not something I'm familiar with at all. Um, I think we've dealt with the 50,000, and it's an estimated figure, but fine, as long as I understand that. Um, is it an age restricted product to purchase? No. So, anyway, um, how does it actually operate? I have one if you'd like to see. Yes. 
I'm tempted to ask if I was wearing it what I would feel, but I might not want to just <laughs> quite volunteer for that. But I, I mean... might quite enjoy that. <laughs> yeah. You might, you never know, you might just be introduced to something. This is a collar that goes on the dog. Right. Obviously sits on the dog's neck, just like any other collar. The owner or the handler has a remote control system. I find it worrying because these things are actually waterproof. I was a, my dad's an electrician. I was always told that electricity and water don't mix, but there we have it. It must be okay if you're a Labrador. However, what you're going to do is if the dog is doing something wrong, so for example, your dog is rushing at the door and you don't want your dog to rush at the door anymore, you would send, first of all, a warning signal, which is just a small beep. Can you hear that? Yeah? Yeah. And then after that, you switch on to the shock and you can send the dog an electric shock direct to its neck. And is that shock in itself um, something that can be varied by the operator or is it a predetermined strength? Some of the shock colours you get on the market are just a box standard shock, so you have no control. This is one of the more expensive and elaborate ones, so I can um, make it as uncomfortable or painful as okay. I like it to be. And Obviously, I'm familiar when walking about sometimes that there are boundary fences for cattle and other animals, which if they touch, the is this the same thing, effectively, mm -hmm. but in a collar that a, 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 an animal's wearing, or is it completely different in, in its strength and um, application? There, the problem with these collars is that there is no restriction on them whatsoever. So there was a study done where a lot of them were actually discovered to be quite faulty. Right. Um, so, so there's a question mark about the manufacturing mm, scissors. When you talked about children, obviously children would only have the, the, the module unit where an irresponsible parent had allowed them to have it, 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 it effectively. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, I note that, that we did have a debate on this in the Scottish Parliament, yeah. mm -hmm. and I, I have here a quote from the Minister, uh, Eileen MacLeod, who said that the position of the Scottish Government is that a ban on electronic training aids cannot be justified on welfare grounds at this time, but that improved guidance for owners and trainers is the appropriate way forward. I mean, she did say she was open to further discussions. From my understanding, obviously you would challenge um, her assertion there, but what do you think underpins her assertion that a ban cannot be justified at the present time? Um, I think it's underpinned by the fact that so many... Um, animal welfare organisations um, are in favour of a ban. No, but, but she, she's obviously not persuaded by that. So why do you yeah. think she doesn't feel a ban is justified? I mean, Obviously you can't answer questions on how somebody else feels. But I, the DEFRA report itself, which was done in 2011, actually states in its um, conclusions that it felt that it did have behavioural evidence that the use of e-collars negatively impacted on the welfare of dogs during training, even when the training was conducted by professional trainers using relatively benign training programmes advised by e-collar advocates. Yeah. Okay, and, and DEFRA That's the DEFRA report. Yeah, they, they also asked if the Scottish Government would reconsider its position and follow Wales's lead um, and ban the use. OK, fine. That, just one final question. How long have these products been available? I've been a, a professional dog trainer for 12 years. Um, I think that they've really been available for that length of time, but they have been growing in trend in approximately the last six to five years. Right. And the bans, finally, convener, that you talked about that have been introduced uh, across a number of other countries that you mentioned, um, are, are these recent or long-standing? They're all relatively in the last sort of four to three years. Right, so there has been an emerging trend against this in, yeah. in a number of other... Okay. Yeah, there, Fine, there's lots you. of new research as well. I mean, scientists at the University of Bristol in Lincoln um, concluded that the use of electric shock collars, this is 2014 research, um, can lead to a negative impact on welfare, at least in a proportionate number of animals trained using this technique. Could I just... Draw this away from welfare just for one second. Um, obviously, I am a professional dog trainer and behavioural consultant. The problem being is how dogs learn. And dogs learn through association. And unfortunately, often the shock is used to a direct a behaviour. But the dog doesn't pick up on that as the actual behaviour that it is being shocked for. What a dog then does is absorb the environment and take into consideration what is in the environment at that time. This is where we see a lot of cases of redirected aggression. 
So for example, a dog is shocked for going running at the front door barking. Okay, so that's a nuisance behaviour. Nobody wants their dog running at the front door barking. The dog is shocked every time it goes near the door. Now we have a dog that could potentially be frightened to be outside. And I have actually seen it happen with my own eyes. I have worked with dogs on that level. Now when a dog is frightened to go outside, when an animal is fearful, an animal is dangerous. And this is where we quite often see redirected aggression because it's rooted in fear. So my appeal would be to get rid of these collars or at least put some form of legislation in that is going to control who can use them and also dog trainers who are advocating their use because they are not understanding the fundamentals of the behavioural science of how dogs learn. Thank you. Uh, Siobhan, where, where are, you know, your petition calls for the ban of electric collars and vibration collars, and well, I can understand the case against electric shocks is, is that much clearer. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't want one myself, but for example, a phone vibrates so would there be any possible exceptions, such as the use of vibration collars for deaf dogs? I can only give you um, my personal opinion on that, and um, I think Claire has a, a quote from the... There is no data to support whether it's OK or whether it's not. I have asked on the Deaf Dogs Network UK, who are the dog trainers who specialise in deaf dogs and helping owners with dogs who have hearing difficulties, their statement was that it's unnecessary, so therefore they wouldn't use it. Because in dogs, we don't get the luxury to decide what is aversive. Some dogs are touch sensitive, so that vibration could actually be seen as an aversion. So although within itself encapsulating, possibly not damaging for every single dog, the Deaf Dog Network UK do work on the fact that they don't need them, so therefore they wouldn't use them. There are alternatives, is the, the short answer. But when, you, talk, when, when you, you speak about alternatives, obviously you're speaking about uh, those uh, callers that release odours and things like that. No. Did, did, did no. Say, did I, I hear you saying earlier there that, that, the that alternative. some of these are, are quite frightening for a dog? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, the, the alternatives is to actually just teach the dog, train the dog. Now... If I, I actually pulled this off the Scottish Government website when you were this is where you're talking about punishing children. Now, I'm not making the comparison from children to dogs. However, how each species learns on the planet is exactly the same. And what you're saying here is dis discipline should not be about instilling obedience or inflicting physical punishment. Discipline is about showing how to behave. That's what I do professionally as a dog trainer. I don't punish a dog for misbehaving. I teach a dog how I want it to behave. It's two different things. So if I want to let a deaf dog off the lead, I have to teach that de deaf dog an automatic recall check-in every four or five seconds. And that can be done using positive reinforcement. So, but we do know that some dog owners are, find it really difficult to control their dog. I mean, is there any other alternative apart from taking, taking it to a professional trainer to, to get it guidance? Is, is, is there any... <laughs> Uh, is there any other way where somebody could could perhaps you know find a solution to help uh, an unruly dog? I, I think or should we not have unruly dogs? I, I think significantly, um, you know, most welfare organisations, most most dog shelters, most pounds um, don't use shock collars. They don't use um, you know any other mes method except um, a behaviourist, a training method and a human touch, um, but yet we're allowing these, you know, these items to, to go into to public hands who have, have no training, um, who have no idea how to use them. So all of our, all of our main organisations, all of our you know, welfare contacts that we've had, um, and we do have, um, are, are very much against using... Nobody uses them. Nobody professionally uses them, but yet we're allowing the, the public... Um, to use them. What you were saying about unruly dogs there, there is actually absolutely no need to have unruly dogs. Us as human beings are creating unruly dogs. For me, the solution to that problem is through education, proper education on how we interact with these animals on a daily basis. And that is available from lots and lots of different sources. For example, I'm a steering committee member and the founder member for the Pet Professional Guild in the British Isles. I represent Scotland in this. 
and we have a massive website that has educational parts on it and teaching and guiding dog owners on how to be using positive reinforcement correctly. The Dogs Trust also do a massive drive on going out into the communities and teaching the community how to be doing it correctly. I work with this day in and day out. It's really simple to do. It's actually easier to do than to apply punishment. So there is no need for unruly dogs. Okay, we're going to get some things that are genetically not correct. That should then be assessed by a professional and then we're on control and management. So there should be no need for dog bites, dog attacks, dogs running away, livestock chasing. There is absolutely no need for them whatsoever. So therefore we shouldn't be punishing the dog when the dog gets it wrong, when we can control that situation from the first day. Again, takes us back to why the collar should be banned. Any further questions? Uh, could the committee then suggest what action we should take on a petition? It's right to the Scottish Government uh, convener, um, and I think it would be useful given that there has been a debate and where the Minister has expressed a view, if she could elaborate on the thinking that underpinned the view that she expressed uh, in order that we can better understand the Government's position. And beyond that, obviously, um, since the ban has been implemented in Wales, I think it would be useful to have some understanding of the rationale that the Government came to there and what they think the outcome and experience of that has been. Uh, and how, if these products are available online, um, they feel that having implemented a ban in Wales, they are able to regulate that, mm -hmm. uh, since I would have thought it must be very difficult to prevent the purchase of the item. Okay, then. Any other points that the committee? Yeah, Chair. Um, and Zala? As a local councillor um, for many years, I've, I've always come across issues with uh, dog and dog handling and how dogs are treated and the unfortunate thing about dogs is that many of the owners and you've quite rightly pointed out don't actually have the skill or the training to handle the animal and therefore if something goes wrong it's always the animal that's blamed and I think this is this is quite an important issue and I think uh, um, Carlos is quite right in terms of uh, making sure that uh, the Scottish Government actually looks at this uh, quite meaningfully. Um, th there's no point in punishing an animal just because the, anim the, the owner is not able to control the animal. Okay. Could I may maybe also suggest that we write to pet behavioural councils and uh, Electronic Corner Manufacturers Association, the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the Dogs Trust, the Kennel Club, and the National Farmers Union of Scotland. And they will have the complete picture. Angus? Yes, thanks, Convener. Can I just introduce a, a, a note of caution with regard to writing to the National Farmers Union of Scotland? Uh, I would hate this committee to give the impression that this is a major issue within the farming community, and in, indeed we haven't heard any evidence uh, to suggest that. Uh, either in the papers or, or uh, in the evidence session today, um, and certainly coming from a farming background myself, I've got no, I've never ever seen uh, electric shocks being used uh, with regard to training sheepdogs, for example. So, um, I would just, uh, I mean, it's up to NFUS to, to highlight that in their response, but it's just to, to, to bring that to the attention of the committee. Can I just say to that point there that because people in the sheepdog training community our skilled dog trainers is probably why you're not seeing them. Sorry, yet. Claire, but we're just winding up, you know. Sorry. And, uh, the, uh, well, Jackson. In the briefing we've received, we're told that the National Farmers Union Scotland is, a, is opposed to a ban, um, along with the Scottish Country Rights Side Alliance and the Scottish Rural Property and Business Association. So I think, in addition to the Farmers Union, those other two organisations, mm -hmm. I'd like to know why it is that they're opposed to a ban, mm -hmm. uh, at least. Yeah. I think you're right. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll take on board the, the points raised and we'll write to okay. them. Could I thank both uh, Siobhan and, and Claire for your attendance and uh, we'll now adjourn for uh, a minute and for a handover.
We are now moving on to agenda item number two, which is consideration of continued petition. So the next item of business is in consideration of seven continued petitions. The first is PE1376 by James MacDonald on banning the presence of free methanol in all manufacturers' products in our diet. Members have a note by the clerk, and can I now invite contributions from the members? Okay. I, mean, I think we should simply close the petition. I think we've done all we can. There's clearly uh, no desire by the government to change, and indeed, you know, some basis upon which they are doing so in terms of academic and other research. And I can't see where we can take it any further. Members agree with that proposal. Agreed. Angus. Well, I was just going to say, you know, uh, to concur with uh, uh, Kenny McCaskill. Um, a number of academics, including uh, Professor Mike Lean of the University of Glasgow, uh, and also the Health Study, the FSA, and the European Food Safety Authority, all consider uh, um, this to be a safe uh, item for human consumption. Uh, so I, I don't see how the, the, the committee can take this forward any further. Um, however, if the petitioner, uh, Mr. MacDonald, uh, does find evidence to the contrary, then he's, of course, free to, to bring this back to committee at a future, level, a future uh, point in time. Okay. So in the meantime, then, does the committee agree to close the petition? Thank you. Uh, the next petition is PE1537 by Shona Brash on behalf of the Coastal Regeneration Alliance on the proposed energy park at Kekenze. Members have a note by the clerk and, and the submissions. And can I welcome Ian Gray, MSP, to the meeting? who has a consensus interest in the petition, and may I invite contributions from members. Ian. Uh, thank you very much, convener, <clears throat> and uh, thank you for the committee's forbearance in allowing me to address this petition once again. Um, uh, the, the core of the petition is, of course, the request to abandon the proposal for the development of an energy park on the site. Uh, and it is the case that that proposal, which came from Scottish Enterprise, has now been with, uh, withdrawn. Uh, and so I can well understand if the committee uh, feel that uh, uh, there's the opportunity here to close the petition. Uh, but I have discussed this with the petitioners, uh, and I come today uh, to make a plea for the petition to be continued, at least in the meantime. The petition does come in two parts. The first is about the, the, the proposal previous proposal for an energy park, but the second part says, uh, and ensure that any future proposals are subject to full public consultation and do not extend beyond the existing footprint of the future power station. Indeed, uh, colleagues may remember that uh, in the initial evidence which the Coastal Regeneration Alliance gave, they presented to committee members a, a master plan for the area which reflects the aspirations of the local community. <clears throat> quite a sophisticated plan which had been uh, worked out through a great deal of work the CRA have done locally with the community uh, to try and uh, draw out uh, what local people would like to see uh, on this site. It, it is the case that the Kikensi site remains a strategic site and so the tension between uh, possible future developments uh, and the aspirations of, of local people uh, remains, and so the petitioners are uh, concerned that uh, this, this aspect of the petition is not lost, and that some way is found to examine uh, how they can have some confidence that future proposals will not be handled in the way that the energy park proposal was, which caused uh, so much concern locally. locally. Uh, finally, I would say that there are some general principles here about the way in which uh, the current planning and economic development uh, processes uh, can on occasion sideline uh, local communities, particularly where a large strategic site such as this one is, uh, is in question. Uh, and so uh, I, I would like to suggest to the committee that they do continue uh, the petition and perhaps even consider uh, referring it to an appropriate committee, the infrastructure committee perhaps, or uh, another as they think appropriate to look at uh, how uh, this and indeed uh, other proposals uh, can be brought forward uh, alongside and with the support of local community uh, rather than uh, uh, without, uh, uh, without their uh, collaboration and participation. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any further questions? John? Community, it's not a question, it's just a comment. Uh, while I expect, respect the views presented, uh, the difficulty is, is that what we have before us is the petition has been dealt with. Uh, Scottish Enterprise, East Lothian Council, as well as the, the Scottish Power have indicated that they do, at the present time they're not prepared to go forward with uh, the, the original proposals. Uh, so, and the other issue is that I know it's been suggested that we refer it to the Infrastructure Committee or to a, an appropriate committee. But just remind the member, the Community Empowerment Bill is going through Parliament at the present moment, and it is hoped the Community Empowerment Bill will actually incorporate the issues that have been raised by Mr Gray in relation to giving communities more uh, of a say and more uh, in the decision-making process in terms of any major projects that go forward. So, convener, I'd be minded at the present moment to close this petition uh, and with that caveat in mind, but then basically write to Scottish Power, Scottish Enterprise and East Lothian Council that we would expect, in line with the current bill going through Parliament, that any future discussions on the site should be taken in a full consultation with the communities concerned so that they are fully in, uh, informed and consulted on any developments that take place, rather than keeping this petition open. Uh, because I think at the present moment, I think the petition has achieved what it's set out to achieve, uh, but it's just one, and the, if the petitioners feel at a later date they are not being listened to, then they can certainly resubmit a petition at a future date covering those issues. Jackson? Uh, I have to say, I understand where uh, Mr. Lewis is coming from, but on the representation of a colleague, I don't think that there would be anything inconsistent in writing to the organisation seeking those assurances, mm -hmm. as Mr. Wilson suggests, but keeping the petition open until such time as we've received an appropriate response, because I do accept that the second half of the original petition dealt with those issues. So I, I don't feel that the committee would be losing anything at this stage by uh, responding to that request, making those representations, and then seeing whether or not a satisfactory response is received, which I think could then answer and meet the petitioner's original request and stand uh, on the record uh, in the, the light of any future proposed developments. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. I wasn't quite sure how um, we, where to take this next, but I think uh, Jackson Carlos has made a very valid point. I think that uh, to ask the petition in terms of what destination they want to take this to would be would be helpful um, for, for, for at least for me to make that decision. I, I, I agree, also agree that there's there's no need to close something. There's no need to have any haste in this. I'm quite happy. If, to wait for the response from the petitioner in the first instance. Angus. Thanks, uh, Convener. Um, I was minded to uh, to close the petition, um, given that the, the petitioner's main concern has been addressed. Uh, however, um, given uh, Jackson Carlo's comments, I'm happy to go along with uh, uh, his suggestions. Any other? John? I'm minded to support the proposal by Mr Carlo, but the problem is, is that while we may receive assurances from Scottish Power, East Lothian Council and Scottish Enterprise, that's not to say that another developer could come along at some stage uh, and put forward proposals and completely ignore uh, the desires of this petition uh, that it should be fully consulted. Uh, and it's really, while I, and I hope we will get a speedy response from the three bodies concerned saying that they would uh, commit to giving full consultation. But the difficulty I have is, is if someone else was to come along and try and develop on that site, uh, they might not be held by the same accountability that we're trying to get from Scottish Power, East Lothian Council or Scottish Enterprise. It's just a, and it, it does raise the wider issue that has been raised by Mr Gray in terms of the current planning legislation that, of course, was passed in 2006 by a previous Scottish executive. Okay, then. I, I think I would... I think the same 
personally, I think the same principle would apply regardless of who the uh, app application would be for development. I think probably, you know, from our point of view, the, the, the biggest issue that I found in this petition was uh, the concern with the lack of uh, consultation. And as a matter of fact, I may want to go further that, you know, if you're continuing this position, I think we need, need as, as a committee to put in record that uh, for the future, particularly with developments of this magnitude, that adequate and comprehensive consultation you know, takes place with the communities and uh, and to ensure that this happens, it might even be necessary to tighten up the requirements uh, that must be met for such consultation and to look at sanctions that can be applied for non-compliance uh, with those requirements. So I think we agree that, that we'll keep the petition open, we'll write to the, uh, uh, the, the, the people that need to be written to and then we'll bring it back to the committee. Members agree? Yeah. Right, thank you very much. Ian. Thank you very much, Mr Gray, for attending. The next petition is uh, PE1540 by Douglas Feeland on permanent solution for the A83. Members have a note by the clerk uh, and the submissions. And can I welcome Mike Russell, MSP, to the meeting, who has a constituency interest in this petition. Can I now invite contributions from members? Mr Russell. Thank you, convener, and thank you for allowing me to attend to say a word or two about the progress of this petition. At the outset, I should say that I think the petitioners are looking for the petition to remain open, and the reason for that is the terms of the petition itself, to, which is to, for the Scottish Government to ensure that a permanent solution for the 83 at the rest and be thankful, ensuring the vital lifeline route is not closed because of landslides. The responses, I think, are, are varied um, in their quality. The one from the leader of Argyll Butte Council, Dick Walsh, surprises me. There has been a, a great deal of work done to ensure that we, the message goes out that Argyll and Butte is open for business. For Council, Council Walsh, the leader of the council in the second paragraph, to bemoan the stigma attached to the rest and be thankful is counterproductive and unhelpful, and I'm surprised that he's fallen into that trap. Uh, the, the letter is also factually inaccurate in terms of the, the military road. The response from the Middle uh, Girl Chamber of Commerce is much more interesting and positive, and it comes up with some positive things to say about possibilities. I, uh, as a person who coined the phrase the Donald Clark option, I think Donald Clark's contribution to this has been very important, but it's not the only solution, uh, and there are other solutions for that permanent uh, uh, progress that is looked for. But the most interesting contribution is that that comes from Graham Edmund in Transport Scotland. Uh, the last meeting, I attended the last meeting of the task force on the 14th of January, and there was a commitment from Derek Mackay, the Transport Minister, that there should be uh, continuity of access, and that's a very important phrase, and I think it was raised here when the petition was heard. What that actually means is that you can get in and out of Argyll on, the, on this road uh, without uh, being impeded by the difficulties that have taken place. The Minister asked Transport Scotland to bring forward proposals on that matter, they were to come to an earlier meeting of committee than the, the group than the standard one in June. I'm sorry to see that June is now the date set. But nonetheless, this letter does confirm very clearly that the consultants, Jacobs, who did the original work, are to revisit the options available with the objective of delivering continuity of access. But as the group has not yet met, the task force has not yet met to consider those, and we don't know what those are and how they would fit in with the petition and the petitioners, then I think the petitioners themselves would want to see that this remained open and perhaps that they had a chance to come back to this committee. And indeed, uh, once we know what those are, perhaps the committee would want to talk to the minister about them uh, because it is extremely important that that continuity of access is, it, it comes into place. Nobody is criticising the work that's been done. I think that the work on the uh, military road has been a tremendous step forward. There's a great deal of work continuing on the netting and the mitigation uh, activities. But the real prize in this is continuity of access. And until we know what that will be and how it will be guaranteed, then I do think the matter remains open. Thank you. Any other questions? What action then does the committee, uh, Kenny? I agree with Michael Russell. I think it would be premature without knowing from the task force. So I think you know, it's incumbent upon us to perhaps you know, write to them, ask to be kept informed. I think suggestions seem to be in June, and then perhaps you know, we need to have some clarity there. So I think it would be premature at this juncture. We need to, to see what is happening and perhaps follow it from there. So I, I think rather than taking a long-term course, it's probably a short to medium-term course to work out what the task force are proposing and then review where we can go thereafter. Committee agreed in that approach. Agreed. Jackson? I am agreed with 
that. Um, this S sort of subject matter is not unfamiliar to the Petitions Committee, though it has, I think, in one form or another, been with here as long as the Parliament. Uh, indeed, the problem has been here much longer than that, of course. I, I would like to suggest we do exactly what has been proposed, but actually flag up now that we might want to take an evidence session with those involved uh, to try and see whether or not, as a committee, we can't bring some uh, additional public uh, push behind what is being discussed when we get to the point where a permanent access is being uh, proposed, because that, that is moving it along to a point where after that something has to be done rather than talked about. So I'd just like to flag up that I, I think we might want to take evidence on that later in the year. Convener, it may be useful when we write to the Scottish Government to ask when in, exactly in June the task force is going to meet, because if it's early June, then it would be useful if the committee were, could deal with that before the summer recess uh, to allow us to then consider how we take forward and look for, an, as Mr Carlow has indicated, an early evidence session in September. Uh, because clearly, no matter what time of year it is, uh, access routes to this part of Scotland are always in jeopardy. Uh, during the summer, it's important because of the tourism. During the winter, it's because of the commerce uh, and the economic factors. So it would be useful to get some assurances that we could get early sight of the recommendations being presented to the task force so that we can then seek an early uh, session with the minister and maybe Transport Scotland officials to discuss how this permanent solution is, access solution is going to be put in place at the earliest date possible. Chair, is there a possibility of um, us actually visiting the location? Because I'm interested why it's taking so long. Uh, you know, infrastructure is very important for our economy and um, I'm quite open to the idea of actually doing a formal visit. Committee visit to Inverary? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Why not? <laughs> we need to resolve this. <laughs> Mr. Russell. Well, Mr. Malik and, and the other members of the committee would be very welcome to the rest and be thankful. Interestingly, it straddles two constituencies. The uh, part where the rocks seem to fall most often is in Jackie Bailey's constituency. The <laughs> people who are inconvenienced all live in my constituency. But uh, if you're willing to, to visit, I'd be very happy to see you there. And I think you would get the impression. It's important to say that this is you're on a stretch of road, so it's not just one place. It's important to see the road from our garden at the bottom of the hill right over uh, as far as the head of Loch Fyne, where there have been incidents in the past. But the major problem lies at the very top. Yeah. You know, I, I was, may have appeared to be flippant in suggesting that we have a committee meeting in Inverary. I, I maybe put it in the minds of the committee members that we have the evidence session from the Minister and Transport Scotland at a committee meeting in Inverary. You would also be able to visit the Tinker's Heart, which is yes. just off <laughs> the main road. Yes. Yes. Uh, my constituents are petitioning many times on these issues, obviously. No, 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 no. No, uh, convener, uh, hmm? I think uh, a visit might be helpful because uh, I believe that our infrastructure is very important and very and it's vital. And um, if it's taking this length of time, perhaps a visit might just help it along in the right direction. Okay, then I think probably in, in winding up this one, then could we then suggest that we we agree that we'll wait to see what the tax task force review is going to say. We will then, if it's at all possible between now and the end of June, uh, do a site visit to the, uh, the, the sorry the, the petition sorry the petition the petition committee. I mean I'm just thinking of the timing here and the arrangements that may have to be made. But we will endeavour to we will endeavour to to make that possible. Yeah. Okay then. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Russell, for attending. <laughs> yeah. Painting Guinness would be helpful. Uh, the next petition is PE1553 by Councillor Andrew Wood on the rendering in industry regulations. Sorry if I missed one. Okay, sorry. I'll go back one. Sorry, the next petition is PE1544 by Olivia Robertson on increasing the maximum sentence for convictions under the Animal Health and Welfare Act. 2006. Members have a note by the clerk and submissions. Can I invite members, any contributions from members? Yes. 
Sorry. We close. I think, you know, the, the issue was raised. We've written to the government. I know there's some suggestion that perhaps we could see when it's going to be reviewed. I think the difficulty with reviewing fines is it depends on a whole variety of factors. It depends on the rate of inflation. It depends on the cost of living. It depends on the, the, the issue. Uh, so it just seems to me that, you know, the, the issue has been canvassed and aired. We have taken it forward. There's no desire by government or indeed great pressure by other agencies to push to increase it at the present moment. Will fines have to increase at some stage? Yes. When will that be? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, and I don't necessarily think that we can second guess that. Any other comments? I, I, Jackson? I'm inclined to agree with that. I think the Scottish Government have made its position clear at the present time. They do say that penalties for offences might be periodically reviewed, but I don't know that there would be any material benefit in terms of real clarity coming from us asking when that might subsequently be. Uh, I think the position of the government is clear, and at this stage, uh, given that some of the maximum fines have even yet to be imposed, I, I think probably I would support closing the petition. Members agreed. Close the petition. Thank you. Uh, the next petition is PE1553 by Councillor Andres Wood on the rendering industry regulations. Members have a note by the clerk and submissions. Uh, can I invite contributions from members? Angus. Um, convener, I think the uh, petition seems to have done its job. It's helped to concentrate minds, uh, and I'm glad that this committee has, has played its part in that. It looks to me like uh, Dundas Chemical Company are, are on board with regard to the discussions between SIPA and uh, DEFRA. Um, so this is actually a, a reasonably quick result from the petition, given it's not so long ago since we were in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, and it's, it's good to see this moving forward at a, at a pace. Um, so I, I'd be content to, to close the petition, but clearly monitor it, uh, monitor progress uh, in the background. Agreed, and I would just concur. I think probably this is a, a, a good result on behalf of the Public Pet Petitions Committee, actually highlighting the problem and uh, being able to get it resolved as quickly. So, OK, so we agree to close the petition. Thank you. The next petition is PE1557 by David Slater on behalf of Sabre White Sands Car Parts and River Views uh, on no Scottish Government funding for White Sands Flood Scheme. Members have a note and submissions. Can I invite contributions from members? Well, uh, things are not proceeding as perhaps it initially cause concern, although I think we recognise that there's an issue there. It does seem to me that on this basis we should be closing the petition, although I think all parties per could perhaps be encouraged and certainly the Council to engage with the local community to ensure that uh, uh, as matters progress, as funds perhaps become available, we can perhaps get a consensus down there. Okay. Members agree with that approach. Okay, I was just going to suggest uh, that in closing the petition, we write to uh, the council because I, I was rather surprised at the tone of the response from the council uh, in relation to the petitioners and the petition that was uh, generated in the local community. Just to remind the council that they should, as Mr. McCaskill has indicated, endeavour to work closely with uh, the petitioner and those who signed the original petition in Dumfries uh, to look at uh, suitable arrangements uh, for consultation and a way forward for the community. Members agree with action put forward then? Thank you very much. Uh, the final continued petition today is PE1558 by John Tom on behalf of the RNB. CC Crayfish Committee, Ken D. Catchment on American Signal Crayfish. Members have a note by the clerk and its submissions. Can I invite contributions from members? Angus? No, no, on you go. No, no. Okay, convener. Um, uh, th this issue actually comes up quite a bit uh, when we're discussing other matters in, in the Rural Affairs Committee. Um, and it's, it's clearly causing a significant concern, as we heard at the Public Petitions Committee meeting down in Dumfries. Mm -hmm. um, I think it might be a, a good idea to get Scottish Natural Heritage in 
um, and also SEPA uh, to give oral evidence to the committee to see exactly where they stand on it, given um, you know, given their current stance and uh, you know, given that the the, the the issue of the uh, American signal crayfish is um, causing more and more difficulties, but in, in the fact that they're uh, expanding the, the area where they where they are. So um, I think the sooner we hear from SNH and SEPA, the better. Any other contributions? No, I Okay, we'll give you that approach then. Yep, great. Right, thank you. That then concludes our meeting. Thank you.